Hallelujah. Father, we bless you, we exalt you, and we magnify you. We marvel in how you love us, God. We are thankful for how you love us, that your love is perfect, that your love, God, is unconditional, that your love, Father, is the catalyst for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And we are thankful that we were able to worship you and sing about your love. So, Father, as we continue to move on in this service, as we now continue to worship by just hearing your word and studying your word together, we pray that your Holy Spirit will enlighten us, that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, that we would see and hear and believe the truth of your word and be forever transformed by that power in your word. And so, Father, we pray in these next moments that you would be with us, every single person, wherever they are, whether they're in their car, in their kitchen, in their living room, in their bedroom, wherever they are, that you are with them, that your Holy Spirit is with them, and that we are bound together, being in one accord of one mind, as we serve and honor and just hear from our one Lord. We love you, God. We honor you. And we pray that you would have your way in these next few moments. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Welcome everybody to Designers Way Christian Church this Sunday morning. We are so excited that you are here to worship with us and to hear a word from the Lord with us. And just before, I just have one quick thing I need to say. You know, there are so many of you who are D-wayers. When I say D-wayers, I mean this is the church where you are fed. This is the church where that you support financially. This is your church. And there are some of you who are supporting the church who are d wayers but you're not on Flock. And so Flock is an application that we use to fellowship. It's the application that we use to connect and communicate with one another. Our small groups connect initially there. Our ministries connect initially there. So there are some of you who are D-Wayers who are not on Flock. I know this because Flock is what I use to search for phone numbers and email addresses because I've been calling on pe calling people, checking on them. And there are some people whose names I see who I want to call, but then I don't see them in flock. And so if you are d -Ware, please do me a favor, send us an email. You can send an email to pastorron at designersway.org. You can send an email to ebony at designersway.org. That's E-B-O-N-I-E. -E. You can send an email to admin at designers way, any of those ways so that we can add you to flock. If you are a D-Ware, I want you to be there because even important information, videos, words of encouragement, all of that stuff that we send out or that we share with even each other, all of that initially happens on flock. So if you're a D-Ware, please send us in something so that we can add you to flock so that you don't miss a thing. We love you. We want you to be engaged in your spiritual family and that is the initial way that we do it. Now, with that being said, if you don't mind, would you open your Bibles uh, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be reading out of the New International Version of the Bible together this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, no problem. All of the scriptures that we'll be going over today will appear on the bottom of the screen so that you can follow along with the Word of God with us. So, 1 John chapter 2. Two. Now, I want to just begin with this. We started a series a few weeks ago that we have entitled World Overcomer. This series is rooted in a scripture, in a text that uh, where Jesus was sharing this conversation with his disciples and he was talking about a number of things that were coming and he was saying, listen, in this world there will be trouble, but have heart or take heart. The King James Version says, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Jesus was making a connection to the fact that often what looks like trouble isn't necessarily trouble because he has overcome the world. There is a set of truths that override and overrule and overpower the facts of the world. This is why the Apostle Paul says that we walk by faith and not by sight because we believe in the rules of the kingdom over the rules of the world. And Jesus 
Jesus was setting up that premise when he said this world is filled with trouble. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. Be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Then the apostle John, his disciple, the one that was sitting right next to him in the Last Supper, writes in his epistle, 1 John, the very end, chapter 5, he writes to let us know that not only is Jesus the world overcomer, but that those of us who have faith in him have also overcome the world. So, this is where we've been the past two weeks. But here's the thing. Jesus being the world overcomer and believers overcoming the world as well as a result of our faith, this information is not new for you. Many believers are aware of this. The challenge for us always comes with walking in consistency with those truths. This morning, we have to begin to lay out what it actually looks like, what it means, and how do we really walk in consistency with the idea that we are world overcomers. I want you to just recognize something. Um, We, although we are saved and are a new creation, we initially had our lives immersed in the world. And for many of us, there are habits, there are thought patterns, ways of thinking and perspectives that we have had in the world that though we're now saved, that still are with us. And so the challenge for believers who are world overcomers is, okay, if I'm a world overcomer, where does the world end and the kingdom begin? Because the reality is, it's of no value to me if I'm an overcomer of the world, if I can't identify the world. Think of it this way. If Israel had defeated all of their enemies from the promised land, but could not find the promised land, that would be of no value to them. How could it be of any value to possess the land of the people you've conquered if you can't find it? And so for us who are world overcomers, if we don't know what we've overcome, we can't actually really walk in the victory and the freedom that we always sing about. We sing about victory, we sing about freedom, but leave a lot of territory on the table. And so I want to begin to have a conversation that really helps us to understand what we've overcome when it comes to the world. And this passage that I ask you to turn to is where we begin. So I want you to look at 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15 is where we're going to start. So the Apostle John has written something here that is critical to us being able to walk in the fullness of being world overcomers. It is going to help us to identify the world that we have overcome. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the, for the Father is not in them. Oh, I want to I want to start in the middle of this. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to exegete. I'm going to e- unpack this, but I kind of want to start in the middle. John says, don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in them. So I want to start with in the world, because John tells us in the next verse, what is in the world? And I need you to understand this because the world is really a byproduct of what's in it. So here's what John says in the next verse. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. See, he identifies the things that are in the world. So notice in the beginning he says, do not love the world or anything in it. He makes two separate, he makes a distinction between the world and what's in it. And then later he tells us what's in it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. So the lust of the flesh, you all are familiar with it. You know what it is. It is, it is our passions. It is our fleshly passions that well up in us. It is the passions that we have associated with our sexuality, right? The lust of the flesh. And then he says the lust of the eye. And some people don't know what that means. But the lust of the eye is the desire to have everything you see. So look, if you are a compulsive shopper, oh, 
Oh, hallelujah. You know what lust of the eye is. If you are somebody who just has to buy everything you see, if you're somebody who is bought into the idea that shopping is therapy, oh, help us, Jesus. Yes, lust of the eye. It's where you want to buy and just have everything you see. And then the pride of life. And the pride of life is the pride that comes from wealth and importance. And so I want you to think about this. Some people call these things the worldly trinity, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. These three things are main staples for the pursuits of the world, right? There are people who wake up in the morning wanting to give their mind, their time, and their dime to these three pursuits. Some people just pursuing the lust of their flesh. They, everything they do is centered and focused around that goal. Some people pursuing the lust of the eye, doing everything they can do on the grind, hustling, whatever they're doing, right? So that they can fulfill the lust of their eyes, purchase whatever they want. And then there are some who they do what they do, get up in the morning and are motivated just purely by the desire for pride that comes from wealth and importance. And this kind of pride is the pride that also causes us to look down on others. It's the kind of pride that says, I have reason for feeling like I'm greater than others. In fact, this is the same kind of pride that when it's mixed with your theology, turns into religion. It's the same kind of pride that we see in the Pharisee who's praying and says, I'm glad I'm not like the thieves, and I'm glad I'm not like the adulterers, and I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector. See, it's that same kind of pride. It's a pride that lifts up over others and that causes us to look down on people as if we have a reason to think that we are better than others. See, these three things are staples in the world, John says, these are the things that are in the world. But the scary things about what John says in reference to this is that these are things that are not just in the world, that they're floating around in the atmosphere. They're in the world because they tend to live in us. I want you to think about it. Because as I was studying this and as I read it, and as I kind of expanded my study and even looked at different versions, I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, am I in here? See, if you're watching right now, I want you to think about those three things that I just described. When you think about those three things, are any of those things at work right now in you? These things are hard to shake because, see, they are woven into the world that we live in. And so when John says, do not love the world or anything in it, the world is simply the environment that is a byproduct of everything required and laid down the principles and the ideas and the institutions and the mottos, everything that's laid down so that people can pursue those three things. There's a lot that we do in the world so that those three things feel okay. There's a lot we do in the world. There's a lot we say so that we can have the autonomy to pursue our passions. There's a lot that we say to justify buying whatever we want to buy and spending money like we just have money to spend. And though we don't, just buying whatever we want and wanting everything we see. See, there are things that we say to make our hearts be in a place to where we can feel like we can relegate people to a space below us, put ourselves above others. There are principles that we weave into the world so that we can live out those things. And that is the world that we were born into. That's the world that we came out of. That is the world that sometimes lingers even though we're saved. And so John says, look, do not love the world or anything in it and he goes on with these three things. And he says, because if these things are what you love, then the love for the Father is not in you. What is he saying there? And I, I need you to, to, to recognize this. John is writing a letter to a group of churches. And he hasn't written this because everything is okay in this regard. He's writing this because he recognizes that there are believers who are struggling in this area. 
And he's saying to them, Look, listen, if your passions, if your affections are on the world, then it's not yet on God. Think about the world that we live in right now. Have you ever looked at it all? Have you looked at the confusion and the chaos and the hatred and the discord and the division and the, the, the anger and, and, and the lies and the manipulation for power? And have you ever just looked at everything that's going on right now and just said to yourself, man, I'd rather be somewhere else. <laughs> See, Paul, when he thought about his life and he thought about his life in the body and the world that was around him, he said, listen, I am confident that when I leave this body, I'll be present with the Lord. And then he says, it is far better. He said, I'd rather be away from the body because I know when I'm away from the body that I'm at home with the Lord. See, the reality is when we are world overcomers, when we have been saved, when we begin to have this relationship with God, when we begin to commune with God, when we begin to have this intimate relationship with him, when we begin to see him more and see ourselves more, we begin to identify things around us. And we don't like the way they look because it doesn't look like home. It doesn't feel like home. We desire something different. We desire an environment and an atmosphere that's like God. And where we are, ain't it. And so John is saying, listen, don't love the world, don't love anything in it. Because if you do, it just simply means that the love for the Father is not in you yet. And then he says this last thing here that I want to show you because, as I said to you, he's writing this letter because he realizes that he's not writing these words in vain. He's not writing this because everything is okay. He realizes that there are believers just like us who are struggling with their love for the world because this is what they came from. That they're struggling with their love for the world because the world is still in them in some sense. That they're struggling with the world because there are habits they've built up. You know, there are things from the world that we do unconsciously because we've done them for so long. And so John is recognizing as this as he's writing it, and he wants them to know that, look, in spite of the fact that there's still a struggle in you, I want to show you how the struggle can be just a bit easier. Because the reality is, it's in, it's in not recognizing the world that we tend to lose in terms of our love for the Father over the world. See, there are moments and or elements of our lives that we have not yet seen that are like the world and come from the world. We just haven't been awakened to it yet. And we have to realize that there is a way for us to clearly identify the world. And so here it is. Look at what he says. Verse 16, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, comes not from the Father. This, that statement right there is the whole key. That statement right there is the central focus of this message today. Not from the Father. Can you identify the origin of your passions? Can you identify the things, the origin of the things that you're passionate about? Can you identify the origins of the things that motivate you and drive you? Can you identify the origin? Are they of the world or are they of God? And so the key to identifying these origin is found in something that Jesus said. You know, Jesus was given a hard time by a group of Jews because he had healed people on the Sabbath. How dare he heal people on the Sabbath? And so he was giving, he was being given a hard time by some Jews because he was healing on the Sabbath. And they were saying, who are you to be healing on the Sabbath? He was explaining to them the authority that he has in the Father. And in so doing, equated himself with God. They wanted to kill him because they thought, who is this? man to make himself equal with God and then he says to them look I, I, I can only tell you this truth I only do what I see my father do the son can't do anything without the father I only do what I see my father do do you see what your father does do you see what he does how do you see what the Father does? 
The pages of the scriptures are filled with his heart. They are filled with his thoughts. They are filled with his deeds. They are filled with his principles. The pages of the scriptures reveal the nature, the character, and the person of our God. I tell you, so many of us spend time reading the scriptures, looking for the things that bring us peace, that bring us comfort, that bring us hope. We look for the promises. We look for the all things are yes in Christ Jesus and the amen is spoken. We look for those things. But do we ever take time to open the scriptures to just look for him? Do we ever take the time to open the scriptures just to look for him? Just to take a look at our God. Just to take a look at who he is. Just to absorb some of the glory that is God. He's given these scriptures specifically so that we have an indication, a recognition, an understanding, a revelation of who he is. Have you ever looked at him? Have you ever looked at him in the intimacy that is prayer? Have you ever spent time in prayer around just simply who he is? I have to explain this to you, but there are some of you who God desperately desires to speak to you about what he wants from you, about where he wants you to go and what he wants you to do, about how he wants you to do it. But there are so many of you who just simply miss it because you don't spend time in his presence. In his presence, you begin to know him. You begin to see him. And I said this in our last series, the more you see him, the more you see yourself. And so when we're talking about deciding and determining what things have their origin in God and what things have their origin in the world, it begins with looking at him. The more you see him, the more you recognize what things are associated with him and his kingdom and what things are not. It becomes easier to recognize where the world ends and where the kingdom begins. And this is so important because there are people who have separated themselves from God because they've been engaged in worldly activity and have found themselves being the, the, the benefit or being receiving negative consequences of the world and blaming the kingdom for it. Just simply because... They haven't seen him. They don't know him well enough. There are some people who have experienced some negative consequences in life after doing everything right. And are mad with God. Because they haven't seen him. Because they don't know him well enough. See, when you begin to see him, you can separate the world from the kingdom. It's easy to determine or easier to determine what comes from God and what doesn't. See, world overcomer is a person who has overcome the world. And if you've overcome the world, don't you want to know what you've earned, what you've gained? And surely you didn't earn it. Jesus paid the price for you. But my point is, if it belongs to you now, don't you want to know and have the fullness of it? To be able to do that, you've got to be able to recognize the world. And it's difficult to recognize the world when you've come from it. Do you know, it's hard for you to see things and changes that happen in you. Because you live with you. This is how it is when we pull these things and drag these things from the world with us into salvation. It's difficult to see the things that are a part of who we are. This is why other people see things about us that we don't see about ourselves. This is why we have to look toward him. So that we get a better idea of what is in us and whether or not it's of the kingdom, whether or not it's of the world. Beloved, ultimately it boils down to truth over facts. Next week, we are going to get deeper into this because the last part of this series, I need to share this last thing with you about world overcoming. And it's really going to bring us to the place where you set your mind on truth above facts Because this is how world overcomers 
live. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. And before I go, I just want to say, for those of you who are listening to me and saying, Pastor Ron, this whole world overcomers thing, I don't know what you're talking about. I I don't know what that means. And I understand. I understand. Um, But I, I want to say this to you. It begins, it begins with believing in the Son of God and what he did on the cross. The, the reality, beloved, is that we are all sinners, every single one of us. God is holy and he's righteous. And because he's holy and righteous in our sinful states, there's really no way that we could have a relationship with him. But Jesus died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins, took the punishment for our sins upon himself so that we could be declared righteous if we believed. And that's what the scriptures say. It says that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you shall be saved. And what that means is that you'll then be justified, that God sees you and looks at you differently, that he no longer sees you as a sinner, but rather a saint. I want you to just think about this for a moment. Do you know when a person goes and signs up to be in the Marines, he will go and he'll sign a piece of paper or she will go sign a piece of paper. At some point, they'll raise their right hand and they'll say a pledge. And when they come out of the recruiting offense, we say that they are a Marine, even though they haven't learned the strategies of war yet, even though they haven't learned how to com- how to actually be in combat yet, even though they haven't learned the ways of the various weapons yet, but because they signed on the line and said in oath, we call them a Marine. And that is a truth, even though the fact is not so. Beloved, the minute you give your life to Christ, you're no longer a sinner. You're now a saint. You may not know how to read all the scriptures yet. You may not have memorized scripture. You may not know the songs. You may not have, you may not know everything that it takes to be a believer. You may not know how to pray yet, but the fact that you have believed on the Son makes you a saint. It is a truth that is higher than the facts of where you are in your relationship with Christ. And you can give your life to Jesus today, have your sins forgiven, be a saint and a son or daughter of God from this day forward. I hope that you will accept that invitation. It's an invitation from the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you're feeling it in your heart right now, it's because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He has a desire to draw you into this relationship with God. In fact, the scriptures tell us that if God begins to knock on your heart, open the door. If that's you right now, I want you to give your life today. It's as simple as saying a prayer that says, God, I repent today of all sin and all wrongdoing. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, set a throne on my heart, and be my Lord. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. I believe that Jesus is the son of the living God who has died for my sins and is risen from the dead. And I accept him as Lord today. If you did that, I'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email at pastorron at designersway.org. Today, if you've done it, this is the beginning of the most epic decision and life that you will ever live. I promise you, your problems may not go away, but your problems will be different as Jesus walks by your side. Hey, Join us next week as we finish up this series. I love you all. I'll see you next week. God bless you. Peace.